Hey, welcome back to the show, everyone. I'm J.B. Shreve with your Faithful Considerations podcast, and we are continuing our podcast series, our story on the days of David. We're five episodes in today, and actually, this is episode number six. We're six episodes in today, and I wanted to start off with a bit of a programming note. At the close of that last episode, I mentioned that our next episode would cover the outlaw years of David. I'm actually going to push that episode out a little. It'll be episode seven in this series. I wanted to go a bit deeper into the topics of Joseph's relationships with a couple of Saul's, King Saul's children. So that's what we're going to be looking at in today's uh, episode. We're going to look at David's relationship with Jonathan and David's relationship with Michael, his first wife. And then next week, we'll go ahead and jump into the outlaw year. So that'll be coming next week. That being said, I also want to do a bit of a parental warning on this one. This is a definite PG-13 rating on this episode, and we cover some content that might not be suitable for younger kids. I'll let the parents make the decision on that, obviously, just throwing that out there. I'd appreciate it if I had have young kids and I was listening to this series as we drove around. And you might want to check this one out for yourself first before letting it play. Um, don't want to surprise anyone, right? So that'll do it. Let's go ahead and jump into our uh, part six of our podcast series. This one is entitled Jonathan and David. So in our last episode, we looked at David's defeat of Goliath, and it's, it's really kind of difficult to overstate how significant that event was in the story of David. Throughout the remainder of 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel, we read references about how David killed the Philistine, all right, turns him into a national hero. And the verses immediately after David kills Goliath and the Israelites rout the Philistine army, we learn that songs begin to be uh, sung by the women in different cities across the land of Israel. Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. No idea what the tune was for the song, but it was peppy enough to catch on like a, a kind of like a popular folk song back in the day, and it spread across the country. And as good as all of this is for David and for the story as we know it today, it's going to inevitably unfold into this his destiny as king. You know, we know that's coming, but the situation on the ground, and this, this song is part of the problem, it actually begins to grow tense, begins to grow unstable. On the one side, we've got Saul, King Saul. He's still there. He's drifting more and more into madness. He knows the kingdom has been taken from him. He may still sit on the throne, but Samuel, the prophet, whose words never fell to the ground, told him it's over. All right, this thing is done. So Saul's drifting into this paranoid state. Who is after me? Who? How's it going to end? The hand of God himself is against Saul. And somehow this king, losing his mind, has convinced himself he's got a chance in this fight. Year by year, he's growing more erratic, as we'll see, but also more dangerous. There's still a lot of power sitting with him, and he can do a lot of damage as he goes down. And that fact, connected to his increasingly insecure and paranoid internal state, is a recipe for disaster. He hears this song. David or Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. He hears this song being sung about David, and it triggers Saul, right? This is from 1 Samuel chapters 18, verses 8 to 9. It says, Then Saul, or this made Saul very angry. Watch this, he said. They credit David with ten thousand, me with thousands. Next they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. That's verses 8 to 9, chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. These are the words of Saul immediately after David defeats Goliath and the Philistines. So you can see where this is going. Well, then on the other side of this tense situation, you have David. The defeat of Goliath radically transforms his image. When he walked onto that battlefield to face Goliath, he's seen and he's portrayed in the story as a young shepherd boy. But when he comes off the battlefield, we never see him like that again. They don't talk about him like that again. He's a champion of Israel, a leader of men, a warrior. Saul appoints him over the, an elite troop of 1,000 soldiers, and they begin making raiding parties, raiding outlets into the Philistines' land. So for the first time, Israel is actually taking the battle to the Philistines, not just reacting on this defensive pudding 
this uh, defensive footing or posture sort of sort of way. Well, that came through David, right? So in David, we see hope, we see future, we see promise, and that's what the nation is seeing here too. That's why they're writing folk songs about him. We don't know how widespread the knowledge of Saul's increasing madness was to the country at large. It never really says, never really says that in the book of Samuel, but there must have been some knowledge of it based simply on the fact of how the ascent of David brings such great hope and promise throughout the country. Saul probably didn't know about Samuel anointing David as king. Not yet. He may never have known that that had actually happened, but he knew someone was out there. Samuel specifically told Saul that God had selected a neighbor who was more worthy to replace him as king. So when Saul looked out and feared that David might become king, that was based on suspicion. It was based on paranoia, on seeing hope and promise and the fact that God was with David, whereas God was not with Saul any longer. So the erratic behavior of Saul is it, it sort of concentrated from David or, or on David from this point onward. King Saul is still going to cause a lot of chaos, a lot of tragedy in the country, and especially within his own, well, his own family. But this story encapsulate how, encapsulates how bad he was getting, just as an individual, by focusing on how he treated David, the hero of Israel. How, it, how bad this is in that same passage that immediately follows David and the, the army returning after the defeat of, of Goliath. If you look in that same passage... That, that victory is contrasted against this picture of Saul. This is verses 10 to 12, chapter 18, 1 Samuel. The next day, the very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul, and he began to rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp as he did each day, but Saul had a spear in his hand, and he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped him twice. Saul was then afraid of David, for the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. He literally tried to kill David twice. Not sure how that worked. The first time Saul throws the spear at David, he misses him. And when it when it pegs into the wall behind the young man and he looks up startled, maybe Saul apologized. Maybe he tried to fake it, uh, you know, play it off. Sorry about that. My bad. I have a deaf nerve in my arm and it spasms, something like that, right? David nods, goes back to his music playing, playing and blammo, here it comes again, a second spear. This divide is starting to get sharp. The whole country is celebrating David as a hero, but Saul, rather than seeing a hero in David, he's seeing a major threat so big that it's worthy of murder. But of course, when reading this passage, even while we know we're, we're tracking this developing schism between Saul and David, we kind of bang on the brakes when we see a certain phrase here, right? Hopefully you did when you're reading, if you're reading along in the story, when you read that, you, maybe there was some, one of those verses there in that passage I just read that sticks out to you. Does that say a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul? Was God torturing Saul? So we got to dig into that a little more. That's the New Living Translation that I quoted there. It honestly doesn't get better when I look at other translations. The NIV, New International Version, says the next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. The ESV says the next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. The Holman translation, the next day, an evil spirit sent from God took control of Saul. And then the new King James, and it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul. So the word spirit here, when we read about this spirit coming upon Saul, it comes from the Hebrew word ruach. It means wind or breath, mind and spirit. In Genesis 1, when it says the spirit of God hovered over the waters, it's the word ruach there. The ruach of God hovered over the waters. But also in Genesis 3, when we read about God coming down to meet with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, the word cool there is ruach. And that word, the sounds of the, that, you know, they heard the sounds of the Lord walking in the garden in the ruach of the day right there. So the point here is not to confuse us about what spirit, but just to make us all, make a, shake off that some, some assumption that we might automatically encode to this verse about Saul. The word spirit here could be talking about something like a demon, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean that. And I think we have to recall the context. Saul was a guy who was transformed by the spirit of God, remember. 
He tasted the grace. He tasted the goodness of God, but he rebelled against God and the hand of God was removed from his life. Well, that removal of the hand of God doesn't mean that Saul was just independent to do whatever he wanted now. It means there was a vacuum, a a space left in his soul that was meant to be filled with the Spirit of God. It was designed for that. And if God's Spirit is not filling that, then another spirit will. Scholars point out that many times in the Bible, mental, emotional, or psychological issues, that we, that's what we would call them today, back then, or in these, these biblical texts, they're described as spiritual issues at their core. They're the effects of an evil ruach. This happens several times in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, we see it. The idea of being overwhelmed with jealousy, with rage or confusion, was often seen as the effects of an evil spirit affecting the person. Now, to be frank, I've seen people, well, I've seen this in people in my own life experiences, people who walked in disobedience to God, people who turned from God, they, they, you could see them get darker and darker as life went on. Issues of anger, depression, confusion, bitterness, they get consumed by this. Now, I'm not saying that all depression is the result of disobedience to God, but clearly walking in disobedience does open the life of the human heart up to darkness. That's the way it works, right? That's what's happening to Saul here. The phrase, a tormenting spirit from God, that's the assessment of what was driving Saul's paranoia, jealousy. It's what was driving his rage. Saul is a split human being. His internal makeup is split. He's, He's sitting and reigning as king on the one hand, but he's also the rejected on the way out king on the other hand. And worst of all, he knows all this. Deep down, he knows he's living out his own path to destruction, to doom, and he can't do anything about it. That season has passed. He's confined. He's in prison to his own fate here. And that drives him to these periodic bouts with madness that are beyond his own control. And so a pattern starts to develop between David and Saul. And this pattern reflects the split the split nature we see in Saul, right? Saul gets enraged and jealous towards David and tries to kill him. This happens not once, not twice, but several times in the next few chapters of 1 Samuel. But then Saul calms down. Someone talks some sense to him or or David plays the harp for for him and and helps the king chill out. So Saul repents. He suggests he was wrong and and he won't do it again. But then the cycle just repeats itself. Rinse, lather, repeat. That's what's going on with Saul. That's the madness part. There's also a more devious part. Increasingly, there are times when Saul is not out of control. He's not raging, but he's deliberately calculating how he can do David harm. And this is a really a fascinating story. When you think about all the other things, if you're into history, if you're into reading some of the classics of literature, when you think about all the other type of books or stories that were, were written, the epics that were written by other cultures in the ancient world during the same time period, or even within centuries of this same time period, the complexity of the characters, the issues, and the drama played out in 1 Samuel is astounding to me by how much more real, how much more sophisticated it is than what you would find in the the stories from ancient Greece or Egypt or Mesopotamia during the same centuries compared to what you find here in 1st and 2nd Samuel when they were written here. And speaking of sophisticated and complex storylines, we have to keep an eye on the subplots developing in the background of this story. In the midst of that growing and volatile chasm between David and Saul, There's another subplot developing. It's the story of Jonathan and David's friendship. Now, this is a big one, and we've got to go deep on this story to get a handle on how significant it was, this relationship, and to grasp what's being spoken about in these chapters. We've already met Jonathan, all right, Saul's son. We met him in the last episode. I think think the one thing we have to keep in mind with Jonathan, he's the prince of Israel. This is the guy who would inherit the crown from Saul. And that reality, once we see it, it adds to the weight of this friendship between Jonathan and David. All right? Jonathan becomes a major ally, a major supporter of David. That wasn't a rational position for this prince. He was moving against his own interests. His own father, Saul, tells him as much. 
he, he rebukes him, corrects him, chastises him. In chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, Jonathan is helping David hide from Saul when Saul is on one of his rampages. So he helps him hide from Saul. He's covering for David at this banquet. And Saul asks where David is. And Jonathan gives an excuse on David's behalf. Well, Saul figures out what's going on. And this is his response to Jonathan. New Living Translation, chapter 20, verse 30 to 31. It says, Saul boiled with rage at Jonathan. You stupid son of a whore, he's for him. Do you think I don't know that you want him to be king in your place, shaming yourself and your mother? As long as the son of Jesse is alive, you'll never be king. Now go and get him so I can kill him. Kind of weird that he accuses Jonathan of shaming himself and his mother after Saul called Jonathan the son of a whore, but got to give the guy a break. He's going mad at this point in his life, right? Jonathan's no fool. He had to know that his support of David was against his own interest. If David was going to be king, that meant Jonathan would not be king, right? They're mutually exclusive events. They can't both be right. So Jonathan had to wonder, then what happens to me? What happens to my family, to to my father's house? And even if he couldn't figure the answer out to those questions, he knew whatever the answer was, he was it was less than what he, he was currently set up for. He could have gone with the flow. He could have just let the king do his thing and ignored the drama. And that would have worked out for his benefit by every calculation imaginable. But that's not who Jonathan was. He's a man of honor, and that honor is what connected him to David and caused him to support the champion of Israel, the giant killer. Support's too light a word to describe the relationship of these two guys, though. Jonathan wasn't just supporting him. In the passage immediately after David uh, defeats Goliath, this is before the folk songs are being sung about him, before Saul is losing his mind, before they've returned from the fight, we see a scene unfold between the two young men. Chapter 18, verses 3 to 4, it says, And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David, because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David, together with, with his tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. Now, we do have to pause right here to look at something. Around 20 years ago, I came across this article from a scholar out of Israel. I don't remember who it was, but this article... It was kind of obscure at the time, but it suggested the relationship between David and Jonathan wasn't just one of friendship. It was a love affair. And the scholar used verses like this one right here that I just read to explain what's being described here is not a gift of friendship, a gift of loyalty, of bonding between the prince and the giant killer, but it's a description of two men getting naked together. That, that scholar was saying that David and Jonathan were basically gay buddies, and that's the real meaning of their friendship here. Well, 20 years ago, when I first came across that idea, that, that article, I scoffed at it, right? That was a major hijacking of the story for modern political arguments and trends. It was a fringe idea right back then, and so I moved on from it. But since that time, and in line with the shifts in our modern popular culture, politics, that fringe theory has quickly moved more mainstream. If you Google search on this, just do a Google search of Jonathan and David's relationship, you'll see it's kind of the dominating view out there now, this perspective, that what was fringe 20 years ago is now mainstream. Now, full disclosure, I don't agree with that theory, all right? Not at all, and I'm gonna get to that. But in the last 20 years, there have been multiple books, academic and popular, about this theory. I read some of them while preparing for this podcast series. They're, they get pretty graphic, pretty gross. But the point is that the fringe theory of 20 years ago is now pushed really hard in academic and popular culture today. There's even a lot of so-called religious thinkers and influencers who push, push this idea. So because of that, I want to go through that perspective. And I want to unfold it a bit here and explain why. Not only do I not agree with it, but I think it takes away from the real story of Jonathan and David's friendship. I'm not getting political. That's not my intent. But because of how dominating this idea in popular culture is today, I do think we have to honestly look at this argument and see if it's true or not. So the theory that Jonathan and David were gay are based on three things in this story, right? These across several chapters. The first is the the verses that I just read, 
right? About Jonathan giving him his tunic, his robe, and stuff like that. It, it, by the way, that verse doesn't say that they got naked, all right? It, there's nothing to believe that, or no reason to believe that they're getting naked in that 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 verse, unless that's what you want to believe there, all right? The second thing after that one comes after Jonathan dies, and David writes a song about Jonathan and David. And within that song, he sings this. This is from uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 25 to 26. It says, Jonathan lies slain on your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. All right, that's the second. And then the third thing comes in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, when they realize the break between David and the house of Saul is permanent, and they kiss when, when they're saying goodbye. The Bible says that they kiss, and the Bible does say that they kissed each other goodbye right there. All right, so like I said, I never thought of all these verses, meaning that Jonathan and David were gay, until I read an article by someone else who suggested that's what these passages actually meant. And I think that's one of the keys to understanding this argument. To interpret this all as homosexuality, your worldview, the way you see life, has to be really sexualized to start with. To, you know, to uh, a hammer, everything is a nail. Well, to someone who's got a really sexualized worldview, whenever they read the Bible, they're going to look for it everywhere, right? Everything's got to be about sex. And that's a real modern worldview. You can thank guys like uh, Sigmund Freud and Alfred Kinsey in the 20th century for bringing that to fruition, bringing that to our reality. I'm not saying that sex was never close to the surface of human beings' worldview and identity, but the 20th century saw that manifest like never before. That's another podcast episode and maybe another series that you can you can find at our sister website, theendofhistory.net, if you're interested. But when you read these passages in 1 Samuel, there's just no reason to shift into a sexualized perspective of what's happening here. When the focus is sex in the story of David's life, it's real obvious. We'll get to this with Bathsheba, right? We'll get to one of David's sons raping his sister. That's all ahead in this story. There's something to look forward to. It's real blatant when it happens. So if this is a sexualized thing being talked about here, why be subtle? A lot of these modern scholars, more... Well, they're more in line with popular culture than with the Bible, and they push this theory to like because they like to have it both ways. They like to say that homosexuality was real common in ancient cultures, and so if it wasn't a big deal like then, like it like it is today. But at the same time, they also say this is subtle in these verses to keep it hidden and let the the reader see between the lines. Well, which is it? I can assure you that the ideas of homosexuality being normal and acceptable in ancient cultures might have applied to the Greeks, but it sure didn't apply to the Hebrew people. Every instance where it's mentioned in the Old and New Testament, it's in a negative light. Think of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Does that story frame homosexuality as just normal behavior? Definitely not. Neither do the injunctions against homosexual behavior throughout the books of Moses. That idea, again, real popular in popular culture, today's culture, and some even in some churches, it's just one false myth to justify another false myth that Jonathan and David were gay. The fact is, David was extremely heterosexual. All right? This is a problem for him. He has some major issues with women, which we'll get to in a later podcast episode in this series. He's constantly, constantly getting married. All right, so you could even set, suggest that his song following the death of Jonathan, where he says his love for the dead prince of Israel was greater than the love of women, well, maybe that's because David had cheapened the love of women to a mere commodity by this time. Maybe if he had one wife, one love, the, the love of women would be a little more valuable to him or hold a different place in his hierarchy of needs. No doubt that his relationship with Jonathan was special, but that doesn't mean it was sexual. What about the kissing thing? Yeah, the passage clearly states he and Jonathan kissed, but that's clearly cultural. The New Testament says believers should greet each other with a holy kiss. Is that referencing sexual love? Of course not. It's also not about a sexual kind of love or affection. When we see Isaac kiss his son in Genesis, or Laban, kissed his nephew, Esau kissed his brothers, Joseph kissed his brothers, Samuel kissed Saul. There's many more examples throughout the Bible when the cultural practice of kissing was just a sign 
of an affectionate, affectionate greeting or, or depart, departure, but not a sexual relationship. That would be like a thousand years from now. People equated every documented account of us shaking hands today with one another as a sign of sexual attraction. Come on. That's really pushing it there. Now, here's the biggest evidence against the idea that David and Jonathan have a homosexual relationship, though. If they did, the Bible would tell us that they did. All right. This is one of the most transparent stories in all of history. This is a guy who had one of his most loyal military leaders and advisors killed so that he could hide his affair with that leader's wife. And the Bible tells us about it. He made errors that resulted in the deaths of thousands of innocent people in his own kingdom. And the Bible tells us about it and clearly points out that it was his fault. He's a passive father that lets his degenerate kids run wild, causing all sorts of upheaval. And the Bible tells us about it. He committed acts of ethnic cleansing, and the Bible tells us about it. He was a descendant of an enemy race and people, and the Bible tells us about it. That's pretty good evidence that he was probably of illegitimate birth, and the Bible tells us about it. He pretends to be insane at one point, frothing at the mouth so he can hide among his enemies. An embarrassing, a shameful act, but the Bible tells us about it. So then why, with all of this transparency, would the Bible hide, or at best be subtle, that David was gay or bisexual? It wouldn't, and it doesn't. That's not what the story is about. Honestly, if that were true, it wouldn't change the story. David committing homosexual acts or having a homosexual affair isn't worse than a lot of the other stuff he does, things he very clearly does. The only problem I have with that theory is that it's taking pop culture and pressing pressing it on to the biblical story. The story of David isn't a validation of popular culture. It's not a validation of sin. It's the story of a man who sought and found God, even though he was a sinner, and he made a whole bunch of mistakes. The story of Jonathan and David, to me, shows the tearing of a timeline of destiny. Jonathan was the future king of Israel, at one point. This is, this is the real story. He was a good man. And that's what drew David's heart to Jonathan. Jonathan didn't do anything wrong. His father did. He simply paid the price for what his dad did. But Jonathan, a good man, sensed the calling and the destiny on David. And that's what drew his heart to David. So the bond between these two guys was born out of a sense of God's hand on their lives, past, present, future. And when Jonathan dies... That's why it hurts David so much. He feels the death of something that was once important to God. Even if God has raised up something new, something better in David himself. That's the real story here. That's the beautiful story. And that's why I hate to corrupt it with nonsense from modern politics and wokeness. One of the books I read for prepping this series. It's a popular one, a New York Times bestseller. But it even went so far as to say that David marries Saul's daughter, Michael, because she looked like Jonathan. I'm just going to roll my eyes when I'm reading that. Come on, really? Find any evidence of that in Scripture. That's just using the Bible to justify what you want. Hypocrites and wackos have done that for centuries, but that doesn't make it right, and it sure doesn't make it true. Hey folks, I hope you're enjoying this podcast episode and our look at the life of David, the Days of David podcast series. As always, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can become a Patreon supporter. Just go to patreon.com backslash JB Shreve for as little as a dollar a month. You can help support the podcast. Plus, you'll get access to our archived episodes from both jbshreve.com and theendofhistory.net. So that's archived episodes from past podcast uh, devotionals that we've done, podcast biblical study series that we've done, also historical series on the Middle East, um, India, all kinds of backgrounders if you want to learn more about what's going on in the world today. Both of those are available to our Patreon supporters at, again, I'm going to say it again, patreon.com backslash JB Shreve. If you forget the link somehow, if you forget that link, patreon.com backslash JB Shreve, you can head to jbshreve.com and click on the Patreon icon at the right side of the page, and it'll take you right there. 
I've decided that. Let's go ahead and jump back to today's podcast episode from our Days of David podcast series. All right, so I mentioned Saul's daughter, Michael, before we took the commercial break. I think her story, I I think that's a good place to end today's episode in this series. Several times in describing the collapse of Saul, I mentioned how he unleashed a lot of damage into his own home. And this, this is the first place where we start to see that reality. The legacy, well, the legacy of Michael's a mixed bag. Her major plot points in the story of the days of David include her marriage to David while her father was still alive, the tragedy that results from that, and then just as infamous, her response to David when he danced before the Ark of the Covenant when he came into Jerusalem. Now, some have described her as a bitter woman whose bitterness gained her the judgment of God, including being barren, being unable to have children of her own in her her latter years or, you know, I guess within her whole life. Honestly, Well, that's just not the way I see the story of Michael. To me, hers is one of the extremely tragic stories of the days of David. It's one where tragedy piles on top of tragedy, and the person of Michael is buried underneath it all. To start, I think we have to see her and Jonathan and David as a trio. These aren't, this was a group, this was a group of friends. After David defeats Goliath, these three are tight. Remember, it was promised that whoever killed Goliath would marry Saul's daughter. Well, Merab was his oldest daughter. So when Saul comes and rather reluctantly offers Merab to David after he kills Goliath, David tactfully refuses. This is in chapter 18, verses 17 and 19. It says, One day Saul said to David, I'm ready to give you my older daughter Merab as your wife, but first you must prove yourself to be a real warrior by fighting the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, I'll send him out against the Philistines and let them kill him rather than doing it myself. Who am I and what is my family in Israel that I should be the king's son-in-law? David exclaimed. My father's family is nothing. So when the time came for Saul to give his daughter Merab in marriage to David, he gave her instead to Adriel, a man from Mahaloa. All right. So the very next verse after that talks about how Michael was in love with David. In fact, this side of the death of Saul, every time we see Michael in the story, She's like Jonathan. She's protecting and pursuing David. For the next three chapters, in fact, we saw we see Saul getting crazier and crazier, more and more paranoid regarding David. And then at the same time, one account after another of either Jonathan or Michael protecting David and helping him hide from the wrath of Saul. I don't think that's an accident. We're seeing the relationships within this circle before the tragedies of Saul stole its innocence. It was Michael, not Jonathan, that was the romantic link to David. Jonathan was like a brother. Michael would be his lover. Well, Saul figures it out. He grows increasingly enraged toward Jonathan for his protection of David. He also begins to use Michael as a pawn in his game to destroy David. This is verses 20 to 21 of chapter 18. In the meantime, Saul's daughter, Michael, had fallen in love with David, and Saul was delighted when he heard about it. Here's another chance to see him killed by the Philistines, Saul said to himself. But to David, he said, today you have a second chance to become my son-in-law. He plants a seed among the troops, Saul does. He encourages them to tell David he should go ahead and seek out Michael as a wife. But David backs off again. He's a poor kid from a poor family. How can he possibly dare to ask the king for his daughter in marriage? Well, Saul has the solution. And through his intermediaries among the troops, he lets David know that rather than money, the champion of Israel can bring the king 100 Philistine foreskins. David counters, I'll double it, 200 foreskins. Now, again, we got to pause here. No easy way around this one. This is another reason why there was a parental warning at the top of this episode. This is just gross. (laughs) It's not something we see anywhere else in the Bible. To be clear, when we're talking about Philistine foreskins, we're talking about uncircumcised male private parts. And I doubt Saul or David were really too picky on surgical precisions when these things were removed. So ultimately, we're looking at castration and mutilation. When we talk about this, we're looking at David doing this to 200 soldiers. 
We're looking at him putting the tidbits in a bag, some sort of storage device, and transporting them to the palace of King Saul, and then presumably dumping them out on the palace floor in front of Saul's throne. And I guess, well, I guess Micah was supposed to leap for joy because she, now she could have the man she loved, albeit, I guess, after he washes his own hands, right? That's just gross. And this is the weirdness of King Saul at this point. He wanted to make it dangerous for David. He wanted to get him killed. That was his strategy. There's some archaeological schools of thought that believe the Philistines were really focused on the male phallic symbol. That's been, there's been archaeological digs that uncovered Philistine trophies and artifacts that seem to be disordinarily focused on male private parts. All right, So maybe some part of this request seemed justified to David because it was striking at something that would be particularly humiliating to the Philistines. But even if that's true, even if it's true, it just doesn't change the fact that it's weird and it's gross. All right, this is a weird, gross request. But this scene also sheds light on David. He's a man of war now. The champion of Israel is he's not all guts and glory, not all guts, glory, and honor. He's got blood on his hands. He's going to get a lot more blood on those hands as the years go by. And later in 2 Samuel, when we come to the part of the story of David wanting to build a temple, a house for God, God tells him, no, you can't. You've got too much blood on your hands. We can, you know, we can compare this kind of to soldiers in like the Vietnam War. Uh, there were some who wore, uh, not all, but some soldiers wore necklaces made of the fingers and the ears of the dead they, they killed. Those are historical facts. Or during the American Indian Wars, when both sides would scalp their enemies. All right, that's all fine. You know, if you want to try to normalize it with that, but it doesn't change the fact this is just a bloody gross scene. David does it, right? This is a man with blood on his hands. 1 Samuel 18, verses 26 to 30, David was delighted to accept the offer. Before the time limit expired, he and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. Then David fulfilled the king's requirement by presenting all their foreskins to him. So Saul gave his daughter to Michael to David to be his wife. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and how much his daughter Michael loved him, Saul became even more afraid of him, and he remained David's enemy for the rest of his life. Every time the commander of the Philistines attacked, David was more successful against them than all the rest of Saul's officers. So David's name became very famous. And the greater David became, the more insecure Saul became, the more volatile, the more erratic. And the next few years show again and again they show Saul making attempts on David's life. And we find Jonathan protecting David again and again. But Michael's doing it too. The marriage, bringing David into the family, didn't change things. It didn't make it better. Chapter 19 picks up the story of David and Michael again. The war with the Philistines rages on. David has just secured another major victory. And Saul has responded by what else? Trying to kill him again. Well, Jonathan talks Saul down and convinces David that things are going to be okay, whatever, this time for real, right? Verses 11 to 17, chapter 19, then Saul sent troop to watch, troops to watch David's house. They were told to kill David when he came out the next morning. But Michael, David's wife, warned him, if you don't escape tonight, you'll be dead by morning. So she helped him climb out through a window and he fled and escaped. Then he took an idol and put it in his bed, covered it with blankets, and put a cushion of goat's hair at its head. When the troops came to arrest David, she told him he was sick and couldn't get out of bed. But Saul sent the troops back to get David. He ordered, bring him to me in his bed so I can kill him. But when they came to carry David out, they discovered that it was only an idol in the bed with a cushion of goat's hair at its head. Why have you betrayed me like this and let my enemies escape? Saul demanded of Michael. I had to, Michael responded or replied. He threatened to kill me if I didn't help him. Now, some commentators that I read when I was pre prepping for this series, they suggest that Michael, in that passage, that she's being disloyal to David here because she was still loyal to the house of Saul. I don't agree with that assessment. That goes against everything else that's happened in this story between David and his wife. She just saved his life. She's got a dad who's out of control. He's literally spying on her house and seeking to kill her husband. She may have been in love with David, but she realized her, her dad's going to kill him. 
So she helps David escape. And when Saul brings her to his throne to answer for what she did, she makes up an excuse. This isn't a story of Michael betraying David. It's a story of Michael caught between her father and the man she loves. She can't win here. David didn't do this to her. David loved her. But Saul's pushed her into this corner, and in that lie, while it's justified, that lie that David made her do this, she isolates herself. She's cut off from David. He can't help her. And she's given Saul the pathway he needs now to hurt David in another way. He takes Michael, Saul does, he takes Michael from her home with David and gives her to another man in marriage. David won't see her again during the lifetime of Saul and before he's on the throne. When he does see Michael again, he's going to have many more wives by that point. The love that he and Michael once shared is fractured by the, point of, by the time of their reunion, fractured into a billion pieces. They're never going to be able to restore it again. And then there's the question, why didn't David go back for her? Why not some dramatic rescue mission to bring Michael to him, even while he was hiding in the wilderness? But that never happens. David and Michael loved one another, but David made the great mistake of, this is the way I read it anyway, he made the great mistake of not including Michael in his spiritual journey. If you paid attention to that passage regarding the escape, you'll notice it says, Then she took an idol and put it in his bed, covered with blankets, and put a uh, cushion of goat's hair at its head. What's an idol doing in this household? We have to ponder that for a minute. Michael was from the house of Saul, not the house of David, and there was a gap in the spiritual development and devotion that she had experienced. But David, as her husband, was supposed to lead her. That was his job as a husband. The word idol here is from the, the Hebrew word teraphim. It's found several times in the Old Testament. It doesn't necessarily mean like a false god. It could have been something like a good luck charm or something like, something like that. But it's not something that should have been in the house of the man who is known as being after God's own heart. That's the way God identified him. But it was there. And its presence, the presence of this idol, is just a sign. We don't want to overplay this, but it is a sign that there's a gap between David and Michael. Yes, Saul interfered and created the tragedy that followed. But David missed out on the steps he needed to take, not, nearly, not merely by, by failing to rid the house of idols and guide Michael to the same devotion to God that he had, but also, in my mind, by failing to go back and get her. That was his job. That was his role. Michael gets kind of lost here. She gets lost in the background for a while. We'll see her again, but not for a long time, many years in the future. And that, when we see her again, that's where the next layer of the tragedy gets piled on. At the end of 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 44, it says, Saul, meanwhile, had given his daughter, Michael, David's wife, to a man named Gollum, na uh, name, I'm sorry, from, uh, to a man from Gollum named Palti, son of Laish. We're not told a lot about this guy, Palti. But there's some traditions within ancient Jewish commentaries and writings. And the overall impression is that he was a very weak man, probably very effeminate, maybe even a eunuch. Micah has no children with him. There's no evidence of love between them at all. After David becomes king, one of his first sets of actions is to get Michael back to him. So when we read about that in 2 Samuel, it doesn't read like an act of love, though or some rescue mission, David brings her back to live with his other wives that he's accumulated by that time. And as she's carried away from the house of Palti, the Bible says he followed along wailing and crying. And some Jewish commentators note that the language used to describe that scene paints Palti as a woman or as a wife. That's the original language, not a husband, but he's, he's crying like a wife and he follows along like a wife. That's what he acts like. Well, if that's true, then that's another stab from Saul, who took Michael from the man she loved, the champion warrior of Israel, the giant killer, and gave her over to this effeminate guy who we hardly know anything about. Her dreams, whatever they might have been, they're smothered in that act by her dad. And the next time we see Michael is the famous scene where David dances before the Lord and the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. Now, I want to tell that part of the story in a later episode, but I do want to focus on Michael's part here. We don't know the specifics that led up to this moment. I think it's, 
it's wrong to read that story just like everything's happening on a straight line. There's a lot of human complexity here. And you can sense the years of friction in between the lines of the narrative recorded in 2 Samuel 6. Michael, the betrayed wife. David, the frustrated husband. Possibly after he got her back following the death of King Saul and when David became, became king, maybe they tried to make it work again. Tried to make their marriage work again, but they couldn't. They tried over and over, but their relationship was as dead as the innocence that Saul trampled over in those intervening years. And usually, as things go, when that kind of hurt enters the soul, people start to blame each other for the hurt that they're feeling, even for the shame that they feel. If you had done this differently or that differently, we could have worked. This would have worked. And this is important. I think we have to see these guys as real people. They carry the baggage of life with them. And what they do with it is important for us to learn from. The story of David and Michael is the story of a broken marriage. And some of that brokenness they carry with them. They, well, they carry individual responsibility for it. Some of it, they're the victims of the times, of the circumstances. But by this point, it's beyond repair for either of them. And the sad story begins. Sad story, but also pretty familiar to broken marriages throughout history. And this is the passage from 2 Samuel 6, verses 16. As the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael... The daughter of Saul looked down from her window. When she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. Why contempt? Why was she filled with contempt? I mean, this is more than a single moment here. Her response in that moment was wrong, but it was born out of years of built-up bitterness. Years of built-up anger, hurt, frustration. When David re returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked and full view of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. There's a lot of stories of marital conflict in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. you got to read between the lines sometimes, but you can find the stories when you do. Abraham and Sarah had some tension. If you ask me, that probably came about from Abraham repeatedly letting kings take his wife, and he'd just say, that's my sister, right? <laughs> Might have caused some conflict there. Moses and his wife had some knockdown, drag out fights when you read through the book of Exodus. We even see it during his return to Egypt, but we see it also after the Exodus. We find his father-in-law, Jethro, coming out to meet with him and to give him some advice about lowering the workloads, probably because the father-in-law realized his daughter wasn't being cared for properly. These were all real people. And David and Michael's fight here is a doozy of them all. I've heard praise and worship songs about David's response to Michael here when he says, I'll become even more dignified than this. That's good, right? I think that was part of his true heart. But I also think this was a doozy of a fight. And in David's response to Michael, we can hear the anger and his own pent up frustration. This is verses 21, 22. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone in his house. When he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel, I will celebrate before the Lord. I'll become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Now we'll see that David's marriages were a constant problem for him. Not sure what drove that, but the only thing that he was worse at than being a husband was probably being a dad, to be real honest. But Michael was his first wife, his, his first love. And even though I find it intriguing to see the real human characters behind these stories, it's also really sad to see the tragedy of the individual lives in these situations. The story of Michael closes out here. We get a last word noting that she never had any children of her own, and it seems a lonely finality to the young girl we first met as part of the trio that included her brother and the young man she loved. The story of hope that began after David slayed Goliath included her. It included Jonathan and their new hero, David. They were young, they were ambitious, they were idealistic. Then the collapse of the house of Saul rampaged through their relationships, through their life. And although Micah disappears from the pages of the Bible, 
and the pages of history, there's one small, tiny, final mention of her that might paint the end of the story in a slightly different light than what we're used to, what we're accustomed to when we hear the story of Michael. Near the end of 2 Samuel, it's just a blurb, barely a footnote, that mentions Michael one last time. And it says she raised the five sons of her older sister, Merib. Remember, Merib was the oldest daughter of Saul, the one that David was supposed to win from marriage after he killed Goliath. We don't know what happened to her. We know that nearly all the members of Saul's household died in the collapse of his kingdom. They died in a variety of, of means, but at one point, David actually goes out and looks for survivors, but can't find any. Well, Merib died too, somewhere along the way, but she left survivors, five sons. And Michael, the first wife of the king, barren until her dying day, she raised these five sons. So I like to think, to hope, for Michael's sake, that the last half of her life was not as lonely as that final fight scene with David suggests it was. Who knows for sure, but there's hope there. And that's the story of David and Jonathan and the story of David and Michael. And it's the story of David and the children of Saul. In our next episode, next week, we will look at the outlaw years of David. That's coming next week here at jbshreve.com and Faithful Considerations Podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone.